gas prices now, right? Okay? Since 1816, tariffs have risen steadily. And in 1828, it all comes to a head. They have a tariff that the South refers to, you need to highlight this, as the tariff of abominations. If something is an abomination, what does that mean? It's terrible. It's horrible. You hate it. An abomination. Oh, it's bad, 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 bad. Do you all understand that? Abomination is a bad thing. That's how much the South hated it. They referred to it as the tariff of abominations. And so it hit South Carolina really, really hard. John C. Calhoun, you need to put beside him, he's the Vice President of the United States at the time. He's from South Carolina, and he's like, I don't like this tariff, and he sympathizes with South Carolina. And he writes something called the Doctrine of Nullification. If you nullify something, what does that mean you're doing to it? Numbing it. Reject. You're rejecting it. You're getting rid of it. Okay, so let's, oh, let's look at John C. Calhoun. He was a pretty fellow, by me. Looks like he might have been a little tired. So the doctrine of nullification says a state has the right to nullify or reject a federal law that it considers unconstitutional. Now, when we talk about this, what's stronger, a state law or a federal law? So how can a state override a federal law? Well, he wrote the Doctrine of Nullification that said you could. Calhoun, the vice president, says Congress did not have the right to impose a tariff that favored one section of the country. Yes or no? Did they? Do they today write laws that favor one group over another or one section of the country over another? They do it all the time. And he said they shouldn't be able to. Daniel Webster, by the way, what are the Websters famous for? Dictionary. Dictionaries. Daniel Webster is a senator from Massachusetts. He's the most powerful speaker of his time, and he's like, no, we cannot have this doctrine of nullification. And boy, these states are all about, they're, they're, they want to nullify it. Andrew Jackson, the president, steps in and says, okay, let me make it clear. I'm against this. I'm against the doctrine of nullification. Do you think that this caused a rift in his relationship with him and the vice president? Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Big, big rift. He said, I don't want to drive the South out of the Union. But I don't favor the doctrine of nullification. So he goes to Congress and he says, hey, can you lower the tariff? Can we come up with a compromise? Was this wise? Yes, that's wise. Okay? Congress reduced the tariff in 1832, but the Southerners were like, you know what? It's too little too late. You have been constantly raising tariffs on us. You've not treated us right, so they're bitter. Okay? South Carolina leaders actually threatened secession. You need to highlight this. Secession means withdrawal from the Union. They wanted to leave the United States. And you know what? They're going to threaten this until 1860 when they're actually going to do it. They're ready to withdraw from the Union, be their own country. That's how bitter they were. Jackson's going to run for re-election in 1832 with a different running mate. He's not going to have Calhoun. He will be reelected. And in 1833, here he comes again, Henry Clay. Boy, he's just really walking a lot through the pages of history, isn't he? Doing a lot of stuff. He comes forward with a compromised tariff. Okay? What would we have done without Henry Clay? He wrote so many good things. And Congress passed the bill. And the crisis ended because Henry Clay was able to come up with compromises. Guys and gals, let me just ask you something. How great would it be if we had a Henry Clay in Congress now that would step forward, that would write compromises that everyone could work with? 
do you think that he kind of had to give in to his own personal feelings somewhat? 